Okay, algebra. Moving on to our next unit. Okay, we are in module three, chapter three, graphing relationships. Let's get right into it. Um, the first one, explore interpreting graphs. Okay, here is a graph already drawn for us about some scenario, and we are going to interpret that graph. The distance of, oops, I already messed up. The distance a delivery van is from the warehouse varies throughout the day. The graph shows the distance from the warehouse for a day from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. So this is from 8 o'clock in the morning to 5 o'clock at night. And this is the distance uh, the, the truck is. The graph represents the distance the truck is from its warehouse. So when it's on the x-axis right here, that means it's at the warehouse. It means the distance from the warehouse is zero. Therefore, it's at the warehouse. Whereas, for example, five, that part of it is that that is when the truck is the furthest away from the warehouse because that is the furthest distance. Okay. So just to give you a brief rundown of what some of that means, but let's answer these questions. Segment one shows that the delivery van moved away from the warehouse. So segment one is the segment right here. You can see as we're, as time goes on, it's moving further away from uh, the warehouse. What does segment two show? Well, segment two, you can see it's still increasing in distance. So it's still moving away from the warehouse but because it's less steep, it means it's moving away a little more slowly than segment one. Segment one is a little faster, moving away from the warehouse. Segment two is still moving away, but at a little slower pace. So we're going to say um, segment two, okay, shows um, uh, truck moving away from a warehouse but slower than in segment one there we go perfect all right fantastic uh, number number two which is really b based on the time frame what changed in the distance from the warehouse uh what change in the distance from the warehouse is represented by segment six? So segment six right up here, the little downhill segment, because it's going downhill, because it's decreasing, that's telling us that the, the truck is going back towards the warehouse, or in a sense, its distance from the warehouse is a little bit smaller. So we can say that because it's decreasing, right? Truck is moving back towards the warehouse. All right, have to apologize for the terrible handwriting. I'm writing on the vertical screen today rather than laying it flat on my desk. So it's a little bit iffy, but it's all right. Number C, okay, which line segment, uh, which line segments show intervals where the distance did not change? So distance is not changing at segment three. You can see it's flat. Segment five, it's flat, and segment seven, it's flat. So segments three, five, and seven. What is the possible explanation for these segments? So because it's flat, it means it's not moving closer to the warehouse, and it's not moving away from the warehouse. Because it's stationary, because it's flat, it means it's stopped. So um, truck is stopped. And that's probably because it's making a delivery. It's probably um, making a delivery, right? So we can say segment three, truck stop, probably making a delivery at that time. Segment five, truck is stopped, probably making a delivery at that time. And number seven as well. Maybe it's getting gas. You know, it could be getting gas. We don't know. It's It stopped though at those intervals. And we can just interpret because it's a delivery truck, uh, right? A delivery van. I keep calling it truck. It doesn't matter. Um, it's probably out making deliveries. It's probably why it stopped. Discussion. Explain how the slope of each segment of the graph is related to whether the delivery truck is not moving, moving away from, or is moving towards the warehouse. Okay. So I'm just going to try and make this easier to write on. Um, 
positive increase, incre uh, aka increasing the slope, means um, it keeps, and now it's calling it delivery truck, and I was going to call the van before. Okay, slope means uh, truck distance is increasing. Therefore, moving away from warehouse. Uh, decreasing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually kind of rephrase it differently. Negative, a.k.a. decreasing. Slope means truck distance is decreasing. So basically moving towards warehouse. And last time I'm just going to say it without writing because I'm just tired of writing it basically. Um, if it's stationary, um, if it's not moving, uh, we will see that flat line um, because it's not going, it's not, distance isn't changing. It's distance not increasing. It's not decreasing. It's not changing because it's stopped, right? Okay. Next one, relating graphs to situations. Graphs can often be drawn to represent real life situations. These graphs are not always easily derived from equations, but rather represent certain situations. For example, these graphs may include the amount of rain over a certain period of time or the height of a bouncing ball over a certain period of time. They represent different things, so I'm trying to say. But here we go. Example one, we have a situation. Three hoses fill three different water barrels. A green hose fills a water barrel at a constant rate. A black hose is slowly opened when filling the barrel. A blue hose is completely open at the beginning and then slowly closed. The three graphs of the situations are shown. So basically, there are three uh, types of hoses. We have a green one, a black one, and a blue one. Uh, what we're going to try and figure out is based on the information it's given us, which one of these graphs represents the green hose, the black hose, or the blue hose. So A is already answered for us. Which graph best represents the amount of water in the barrel filled by the green hose? So the green hose uh, fills the barrel at a constant rate, meaning it's always going up at the same pace. It's not going faster or slower at any point in time. It's always increasing at the same pace. This is shown by graph B. Graph B, the second graph here, is increasing at a very steady pace. It's the same throughout. B, describe the water level represented by each graph, then determine which graph represents each situation. So the water level for A. So A, the graph starts off slow. Water is being poured in slowly, but then it goes increasing really quickly. So the water is being poured in much faster at the end. So water um, starts slowly, but gets faster over time. And graph C, well, is the opposite. It's going skyrocketing at the beginning, right? It's going up really, really fast at first, but then it sort of levels off, right? It goes slower and slower over time, but it's really, really fast in the beginning because it's going up really, really fast in the beginning, but then it flattens out over time, meaning it's going a little slower at the end. So, water increases fast, then uh, slows down. So graph A represents which hose? We already know the green hose was the was was B. Okay, a black hose is slowly opened 
when filling the barrel. So a black hose, if it's slowly opened, then that means it's gonna have a little water at first, but as it opens up more and more, it'll the water will increase. The water will go faster when it's filling up. So the black hose represents an excellent, uh, represents B exactly. Because a black hose, it's opening slowly, so it's not gonna have a lot of water at first, but once it's opened up, it's opened up, right? And it can really fill up the barrel quickly. So A rep is represented by the black hose. And of course that means C is the blue hose. The blue hose is completely open at the beginning, so it's just pouring out water, but then it's closed off, or it slowly closes. So it's pouring water in the beginning, going up really, really fast, and then as the uh, as it closes, water doesn't really go up as quickly. So uh, C is representing our blue hose. Could a graph of the amount of water in a water barrel slant downward from left to right? So it would be like this. Could it slant downward? And the answer, I guess, would be yes if you are emptying the barrel. It doesn't necessarily have to be emptying. You know, it could be um, that you're just letting water out of the barrel. But yeah, if, if the graph is going downwards at all, uh, from left to right, it, you know, it could be going downwards like this, or like this, or it could be going down constant. Uh, but if it's going downwards, the slope is going down at all, from left to right, um, then that means that water is being taken out of the barrel, that the, the barrel is decreasing in volume of water. So let's try it here. You and a friend are playing catch. You throw three different balls to your friend. Um, you throw the first ball in an arc, and your friend catches it. You throw the second ball in an arc, but this time the ball gets stuck in a tree. You throw the third ball directly at your friend, but it lands in front of your friend and results the and, and rolls the rest of the way on the ground. Three graphs of these situations are shown. So basically, we've got to figure out which situation, which graph matches which situation. We know one of them, we throw a ball and our friend catches it. We know another one, we throw a ball and get stuck in a tree. And the last one, we throw the third ball and it lands in front of our friend and then rolls the rest of the way. So, which graph represents a situation where the ball gets stuck in the tree? This one might be tricky for some people because of B or C. It's definitely not A. Um, but B or C, we can see uh, looking at um, B, the ball is going up higher, right? Basic, notice where it's starting, right? It's not starting on the ground because we're not throwing it from the ground. We're not kicking it off the ground, right? Where we release it from our hand, it's already getting a head start up in the air, right? I would release it like five feet, six feet above the ground. So that's why it's heights here, right? And the ball goes up in the air, and then it comes back down and lands here. Now, it's not landing on the ground, right? The ball doesn't hit the ground. So the ball's getting stuck right here. But that's not being stuck in a tree, right? Let's look at C. Again, we have the same release point, so it's not starting on the ground, it's starting up in the air because when we throw it, it's already starting about five or six feet above the ground, right? The ball goes up and then it stays up, right? It's not coming back down at all for our friend to catch it. It stays up. So C represents the situation where it's getting stuck in the tree because clearly I threw it up and then it got stuck right up here in the tree and now it's stuck in the tree. It's, it stays up there in the tree. Describe the height of the ball represented by the other two graphs. So A is when we threw the ball at our friend but it lands on the ground and rolls. 
So yeah, you can see here we are, we're throwing it, the ball goes straight down onto the ground, and now it's on the ground, it's rolling on the ground. So um, that's that situation, graph B, graph B, we throw the ball up, and it comes back down for our friend to catch. So you can see that, right? We're throwing it up. The height of the ball is way up here, but then the height of the ball is coming downwards, right? And it stops here because our friend catches it right there, right? The, our friend doesn't let the ball hit the ground. It's not zero because the ball doesn't hit the ground. Our friend catches it in the air. And you can tell that it ends at about the same height as we started. So, you know, I if I'm throwing it about five feet above the ground, my friend is catching it about five feet above the ground because that's just how tall we are, you know? All right, explain uh, number two, sketching graphs for situations. Some graphs that represent real world situations are drawn without any in interruptions. In other words, they are continuous graphs. A continuous graph is a graph that is made up of connected lines or curves. Other types of graphs are not continuous. They are made up of distinct and unconnected points. These graphs are called discrete. So continuous and discrete. Sketch a graph of the situation. Tell whether the graph is continuous or discrete. So A, looking at the graph immediately, it's got points and not a line. Therefore, it is discrete. Um, a continuous graph would be a line. A discrete graph has these points. So a student taking the test, there are 10, multiple, uh, 10 problems on the test. For each problem the student answers correctly, a student received 10 points. So it's discrete because he's getting 10 points for each problem. And those are the exact numbers. There's no, no room to fill in the little gaps in between the lines because we're not getting any partial credit. It's just 10 points for the problem, 10 points for the problem, 10 points for the problem, and so on. Filling up all those little dots. And it explains it here. The student can get anywhere from 0 to 10 questions right. The domain is a whole numbers from 0 to 10. If the student gets 0 problems correct, the student gets 0 points. If the student gets 10 problems correct, the student gets 100 points. So the range is whole number multiples of 10 to, from 0 to 100. Let's try B. A bathtub is being filled with water. After 10 minutes, there are 75 quarts of water in a tub. Then someone accidentally pulls the drain plug while the water is still running and the tub begins to empty. The tub loses 15 quarts in 5 minutes and then someone plugs the drain and the tub uh, fills for 6 more minutes gaining another 45 quarts of water. After a 15 minute bath, the person gets out and pulls the drain plug. It takes 11 minutes for the tub to drain. So we have a lot of information here that we need to graph. Let's start one at a time. After 10 minutes, there are 75 quarts of water in the tub. So we're filling it with water. 10 minutes, there are 75 quarts in the tub. So let's start with that. We're filling the tub. After 10 minutes, we have 75 quarts. So 75 would be right here, right? That's 75. So after 10 minutes, right, we have 75 quarts of water. So this first part of the graph is us filling up the, the bathtub with water. So we get the 75 quarts at 10 minutes. Then someone accidentally pulls the drain plug while the water is still running and the tub begins to empty. The tub loses 15 quarts in five minutes. So for the next five minutes, the, the tub loses 15 quarts. So it's losing, it's going down from 75 to 60 over that period of time. So that's five minutes right there. That takes us to 15 minutes if we're looking at our graph, right? So the first 10 minutes, we were filling it up. Then five minutes came where it uh, decreased a little bit. So it plugs the drain back up and a tub fills for six more minutes, gaining another 45 quarts. So for the next six minutes, it gains another 45. So 60 quarts now, 45 quarts would be about 100 and five, right? So 105, that's this line here. So we're going to have to go all the way up to that. So six minutes, about 20, right about there. So that's us, you know, plugging our drain, the water going back up again. Um, 
After a 15-minute bath, the person gets out and pulls the drain. So the person's in the bathtub for 15 minutes. So the water's not going up or down over that period of time. The person's just chilling in the bathtub. So the water level stays the same for 15 minutes. So we're going from 20 to about 35-ish. Right there. That's 15 minutes because we're going from 21, well, essentially 20, so to about 35. It's 15 minutes right there. Then the person pulls the drain plug and it takes 11 minutes for the bathtub to drain. So 11 minutes would be about 46, 47 minutes, about there. So for that period of time, the bathtub is draining and we're losing water. So there is our graph for our bathtub. This graph is continuous. So we're not talking about discrete points like we were with the, with the, the quiz problem up here. Um, the bathtub fills up slowly over time or quickly, doesn't matter, but it's filling up. Um, it goes over that intervals. You can't just have um, one quart of water and then immediately have two quarts of water and then immediately have three quarts of water. It doesn't, it doesn't go up one, two, three quarts of water at a time, right? It goes up slowly over time, one, two, three quarts of water, and it increases gradually. So therefore, it's continuous. The domain... The domain is, I'm uh, wondering what it means by that. Does it mean minutes? Oh, okay. So the domain is, is our minutes, but it's going from zero minutes all the way up to 47 minutes. Because if you actually add up everything, this was 10 minutes, this was 15, this was at 21, this was at 36, and this was at 47. Because remember, the first stint was for 10 minutes. The second stint was for 5 minutes, making it 10 plus 5 is 15. Then the next one was 6 minutes, which gets us to 21. Then it was 15 minutes, which gets us to 36. And then it was 11 minutes, getting us to 47. The range is from 0 all the way up to 105. That was the max that we got our, uh, our water level to. So range is our y-axis, it's our water level, and the domain is our x-axis, which is our time. All right, sketch a graph of the situation. Tell whether the graph is continuous or discrete and determine the domain and range. So at the start of a snowstorm, it snowed two inches an hour for two hours. So let's underline that, snowed two inches an hour for two hours. So after one hour, it would have been two inches. After two hours, it would have been four inches because it went up two inches per hour. Then it slowed to one inch an hour for an additional hour. So for the third hour, it's only going up one inch. So it's going up to five inches at the three hour mark. So again, just to re re recap. Right? The first two hours, it went up two inches at a time. So the first hour went up to two inches. The second hour went up to four inches, right? Increasing two inches during those periods of time. But then from the next hour, from the second hour to the third one, it's only going up one inch. So you can see it's a, a little flatter there. Three hours after the, so the snowed... <laughs> Three hours after the snow stopped, it began to melt. Oh, hold on a second. I'll be right back. Okay, I am so sorry for that interruption. Um, I can't edit the video, so I was like, I'm sorry. Anyway, uh, back to where we are here. So, um, three hours after the snow stopped, it began to melt. So, for three hours, the snow wasn't melting and wasn't gaining. So, for three hours, it was staying stationary. So, from the third hour to the sixth hour, it was constant at that five-inch mark. 
But after those three hours, it begins to melt um, at one half an inch an hour for two hours. So it melts half an inch, one hour, and melts another half an inch for another hour. Right there. Ooh. And we're actually running out of room. We should have eight hours there if I did my math correctly. Yeah. Should be up to hour eight. Okay. Um, oh, I guess it wants to tell uh, discrete, continuous, domain and range. So this is definitely continuous. Because again, we're not just walking outside in one minute, you know, one snow. It's, it isn't like the snow on the ground isn't going to just increase at one inch and then two inches and then three inches, right? It doesn't just stack up quickly like that. It goes gradually over time, increasing from one inch to two inches to three inches and so on. So it's continuous. Another general rule of thumb is if it's measured, it's continuous. If it's counted, it's discrete. So if you can count the things, it's discrete. But if it's measured, it's continuous. Like height is measured, time is measured, right? Um, so that's why in this case, because we're talking about the height of the snow, right? That's measured, that's continuous. Um, our domain for at least this problem is from zero to eight. That doesn't really give us much information after the eighth hour. Um, our range is from zero to five, because it goes up to five inches of snow. And you can use really X and Y here. I'm using D and R for domain and range, but you can say X and Y technically. Right, because the domain is for the x hours, that's our time, it goes up to eight, and the range is our y values, um, the height of the snow, which went up to five. All right, and number six, a local salesman is going door to door trying to sell um, vacuums. For every vacuum he sells, he makes $20. He can sell a maximum of 10 vacuums a day. So, uh, number of vacuums. If he sells one vacuum, well, if he sells zero vacuums, he makes zero dollars. I'll start with that. If he sells one vacuum, he makes $20. So one vacuum, $20 right there. If he sells two vacuums, he makes 20 more dollars. It's $40, right? If he sells three vacuums, he makes, uh, $60. Four vacuums would be 80. Five vacuums would be a hundred dollars. Six vacuums would be 120, seven would be 140, eight would be 160, nine would be 180, and then 10 vacuums would be $200. Now, he can't go more than 10 vacuums, right? He can sell a maximum, maximum of 10 vacuums a day. So this one, because we're counting how many vacuums we can sell, it's countable, not measurable. This one is discrete. Discrete. Now our uh, domain, um, I'm not going to write it from 0 to 10 like I did with the continuous one. What I'm going to write as instead um, is we're just going to say uh, whole numbers from 0 to 10. And then range Range is a little more interesting because it goes up by 20s. So whole number multiples of 20, whole number multiple of 20 from 0 to 200. Whole number multiples of 20, 20, 40, 60, 80, etc. right? Um, those are the multiples of 20, and we're going from 0 all the way up to 200. That would be our max. Um, all right, I'm going to end the video here. I know it's been long, guys. It was a long bit of notes, but this is probably like two days worth of notes. So leave it there. I'll see you guys later in the next section.